Um, it was August 7th, very vivid. Um, we had just gotten done uh, that morning around 9 o'clock because uh, the night before we were busy and we did, it's called an AAR, After Action re Report. And we do this every morning just to make sure uh, and talk about what happened the night or that day. We do our action reports to get better, uh, to serve our soldiers better. What can we do better? So that's what AARs are all about. Um, so after we finished our AAR, I went back to my sleep tent um, just to get a few things. And I mean, it was a gorgeous day, actually one of the best days we had in a long time. And, but it was quiet, which was unusual. That should have give us a clue right there and then. It wasn't if we were going to get hit, it was when we were going to get hit. Because you could feel it. You could feel it starting. And it's, it, you can't really describe it. It's just that innate thing, the knowing. Something is going to happen. Don't know when, but it's going to happen. Well, it was quiet. I was starting to walk back to the FST. As I'm walking back, I feel a thump, and it was like thump. I'm like, and it was just, it was like slow motion, and I'm sure you've, you've heard that before. It's like a slow motion thing. And as I'm walking, I take one more step, and I just feel myself just kind of lifted up. And I had, it was like a rag doll, but it felt like a, like hand, a, two hands just squeezing, just and as it's squeezing, it's still, I'm still being propelled. And I hit, it's called the Alaska Wall. And it's a thick cement wall. And it's about maybe two feet thick. And at least, I think it was 20 feet high. And what these walls do is, in case we do get mortared or whatever, it'll hit that first. It's like a, a, a buffer. So it's in front of the FST. So I'm walking, get squeezed, I'm being propelled. The, ne the next thing, I see the Alaska wall. I can't do anything about it. Now, I don't have any IOTV on or anything. It's just my uniform and my, my cap and my cup, and my little cup of coffee. I hit the wall and I hit it right through here. Bam! Next thing I know, Someone's on top of me, and they keep saying, are you okay? And the only thing I remember is, I can't breathe. Well, I think it was because he was laying on top of me. And that was the end of it. That's all I remember. Next thing I know, I'm finally, I guess I'm being woken up, or I'm starting to wake up. I'm on a litter, or it's called, or the stretcher. Protocol is two straps uh, over the arms and over the legs. They gave me three straps. And the only reason why they gave me three straps is because I was trying to get up. Because I didn't know what happened, number one. And I was hearing so much chaos around me because of the screaming, of the yelling, just, just everything. It's not a quiet fob anyway because of all the generators. So it's, there's always constant noise, but this is now amplified. And I'm trying to get up, but I can't move my legs. I can hardly move my arms, but I'm just doing this. And I keep getting this. Lay down. Lay down. Stop. Stop moving. Lay down. So I finally quit. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing faces, you know, looking down at me. And it's like, what happened? Again, I, I can hardly hear because the explosion was so big. I mean, I'm surprised. I've lost some hearing on my right side that it was like, what? And everyone's, I said, screaming. So I was like, okay. Then they told me that a vehicle-borne IED exploded outside of the wire. Now, where we were at, it was only a 30-second walk from the wire. And it was a big water truck that a month prior had been stolen. And Unfortunately, the drivers, Afghanis, were kidnapped. They were beheaded because they were helping the Americans. 
they had basically taken all the water out and they had put in 3,000 pounds of military grade explosives. Now this is all after I had come back and found out about it. But that's, that, that's what happened. Instead of exploding at 10 o'clock that morning, they exploded it at 937. They got antsy and there were two people in that truck. And the only reason why they know of this is because we had this thing in the sky called Eye in the Sky and everything was being videoed. And it was, they saw everything happen. Couldn't stop it, unfortunately, because, well, what happened is in the back, they had Afghani soldiers back there. They never stopped that water truck. They let it roll behind, which they shouldn't have done. And that's how it exploded. They got edgy. It, it, it basically cleared 75 feet of the wire um, open. And luckily, um, the SFs were home. The Rangers were home. They had just gone to bed. And when it hit, they came out. They were still in their underwear. <laughs> they had their eye I mean, they were ready for war. They were ready to fight. The 173rd then was embedded with us as well. Those kids came out fully geared, and they all ran where we were at because we didn't know whether or not there were more Taliban behind them. So all this is going on. Helicopters, Apaches, Kiowas. I mean, it was just like, oh, my God, waiting for the medevacs. And during all this time, we were being mortared as well. So they would not leave the too many of us out there, but when they got mortared, they all had to run into the bunkers. So we were just kind of laying there going, okay, what's next? Luckily, it never hit our area. Um, it, it, it killed more of their people. None of our unit members were hurt. No Americans were hurt. It was their people. Again, what's the sense in that? Uh, so, and as I said, it, it was just absolute chaos. The next thing I knew, the tra the tra one of the trauma surgeons uh, came, came running around assessing everybody, and he basically said, you know, you're next. We don't know whether or not your back's broken. Because the way I was laying, as I said, I couldn't move my legs, and my left leg basically got dislocated by hitting the wall. Uh, shoulders were dislocated, this was dislocated, even this was dislocated, which I'm still trying to figure that out, but that's why I couldn't move or anything like that. So anyway, the medevacs finally were, co were coming in. They put me in the medevac, and I always wanted a helicopter ride, but that wasn't the helicopter ride I wanted. So there I was on the, the, the bird, just kind of looking over. And as we were lifting up, um, I could see what had happened, and it looked like a huge hurricane had gone through. We lost everything. We totally lost the whole camp. We lost the FST. So basically, as I'm lifted off, other you know the other um, medevacs are coming in, and they said it was a mass casualty of over 65. In fact, I had an Afghani uh, merchant that because they had little shops behind us of course all of the shops were blown up they lost everything and unfortunately this young guy got hit pretty bad so you know I just laid there and I, and I told the evac guys I said don't worry about me worry about him I mean because I knew I, at the because they, when they assessed me I knew I wasn't bleeding outwardly so and I was talking to him so I thought I'm, I'm fine, you know. Again, the hard head, medical, <laughs> nurse, <laughs> you know. So um, I'm fine, I'll be all right, you know, denial big time. So they took care of him and then finally landed at Bagram. And that was a zoo as well. Because at that time, Sharona, Fob Sharona got hit as well. Didn't know that. So it was a, um, a coordinated effort by the Taliban. We got hit first, and then they got hit. Got off the bird, um, got into the emergency room area. They assessed me right away. Um, there's a thing we're called trauma naked, 
where as soon as you get in there, they cut everything off. Well, I was awake by that time, fully awake then. And I had a C collar on, which I didn't even know I had on. Um, and I just looked at the nurses and I said, do not cut my uniform off. They're like, but we need to. I said, do not cut my uniform off. And they just kind of looked at me and they said, you're a nurse, aren't you? And I went, yes, I am. Don't, turn, don't cut it off. Because <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. So they, you know, they took my uniform off. They did have cut off my T-shirt and stuff. But um, then uh, a lot of the medical uh, colonels came around. And they knew who I was because they had visited the FOB. They were like, oh, my God, you're here. So maybe that helped out, too. I don't know. So got CT scan right away, make sure there was no internal bleeding, no internal bleeding of the head or anything like that. Um, then I was put into the, the ward, but I had to lay there for at least six hours. But the, then that's when the headache came, the bloody nose came, then all of a sudden the pain, because the adrenaline was finally gone. And that's when everything finally hit. It was like, oh my God. You know, oh my God. And come to find out too, one of our trauma surgeons, we had two of them, also got hurt. He had shrapnel in his shoulder. He got caught in a sleep tent and he got banged up pretty bad. And what was his name? His name was Colonel Ellison. Um, he, he was uh, full time. He was from Fort Bragg. He came up as a private all the way up to Colonel. So he was hardcore, hard, <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> and he didn't know I was hurt either until I heard him saying some explicatives, uh, some adjectives that weren't very nice to some of the people because they kept touching that area. And I said, we all went th by call names. And it was, his call name was Big E for Big Allison. And I go, Big E, are you there? And my call name was Mama Bear. He goes, Mama Bear, is that you? Like, yeah. So anyway, so now we know that we're there together. So um, Sergeant Majors come through, the colonels come through, uh, and come to find out um, the reports given to everybody for us were uh, Colonel Ellison had uh, below the knee amputation of the leg, which he did not, thank God, and I had a, a fractured skull. Of course, I did not. So, you know, there was, again, because of all the chaos, a lot of misinformation. So when the colonels came down from a task force, it was like, oh my God, what are we gonna look at? They're, oh, you're fine. It's like, yeah, I'm great, I'm just perfect. So I was there for about a week, uh, went through the TBI um, protocol. I mean, the headaches were just horrendous to the point I couldn't even go outside because the light hurt so bad. Um, Colonel Ellison was also in the TBI area um, doing his thing. And he was ready to go home. And he basically said, I'm not going home. I go, I've got to get back to the FOB. And they also wanted me to go home. And I'd gotten friendly with the other nurses. So they were doing all the paperwork. And basically, they came up to me and they said, well, we're getting you ready to go to Lanchstool. And I said, what for? you got hurt, you got, you know, we, they don't want you out here because you're hurt. And I said, I'm fine. And they said, do you still have ringing in your ears? Because that was one of the big things. You still have the ringing. Of course I did. I lied. I said, no, the ringing's all gone. I can hear you. And they said, how's your headaches? And I said, they're just mild now. They're bangers, but, you know, I, I'm fine. I'm cool. You know, get the other ones out of here. Don't, don't waste your time. I got to get back to the FOB. So they talked to the doc, and the doctor said, Well, all right, you know, mm, yeah, okay. So, all right, so I'm going back to FOB Shank. Colonel Ellison finds out about this. And he says, If Major Justice is going back, I'm going back. So basically, they told him, If you can put your IOTV on by yourself within two weeks, you can go back to the FOB. Fine. So at the same time, though, I had to start putting my IOTV back because they had to put my shoulders back. Hurt? Oh my God. It hurt so bad. But it was like, yeah, see, I got it. I got my IOTV on. I can do it. I can hear you. I'm great. I'm good to go. And so he, I guess we were both the motivators for each other. 
because he would, you know, I'd be like, you can do it, Allison. Come on, Biggie, you can do it. And he would say, come on, my bear, you can do it. So I was like, okay, okay, ah, I finally got it. So in two weeks, he got his on. So luckily he came back to the FOB. So yeah, so during that time while I was gone, um, the unit members, they were banged up too, but not hurt as bad, um, got the FST up and running a makeshift within four hours because of the chaos. We couldn't be black. So the people that were around us pretty much picked up as much supplies and medical stuff that had blown out and put them on bags. And then we, when I finally got back within that week, the, the FST was up and running again. So I was only there for about 30 more days. And of course, during that 30 days, we got hammered again. Um, this time though, we didn't have a sleep tent. We had this big uh, Alaskan thing. And it was very austere out there because we lost the showers. We lost the latrines. It, it was crappy out there, literally crappy out there. And I bet your injuries didn't make it any easier. No, it didn't because the, I try to focus as much as I could, but the focus was hard. Um, reading was hard. Um, I had to wear my sunglasses all the time, even inside the FST because of the lights. Um, the headaches were horrendous. And just picking up, pulling, it was rough. I mean, the guys knew about it, but they were so busy themselves, it was like, I'm not doing the burden on them as well. I, I couldn't do it. I mean, it wasn't fair. So yeah, it was, it was rough. <laughs> I bet it was nice to be back with the unit though. Oh, it was. Um, a lot of the guys thought I wasn't coming back um, until I called from the packs and said, come pick, come pick me up, please. Um, you're back? Yeah, I'm back. Great. Because I was the only OR nurse there. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty stretchy, you know, pretty stretchy there.